Thank you, Toro. <clears throat> Beautiful words. I want to thank also, before starting, the Keenan Institute for providing the occasion uh, for uh, this grand visit to Duke, also for providing a beautiful day and a beautiful space. Uh, it's very good to be here. It was while I was thinking about preparing a text in which I would attempt to take further some earlier thoughts of mine concerning Wittgenstein's reflections on the concept of seeing something as something, what he calls seeing aspects, which dominate part two of philosophical investigations. It was then that I reread uh, a paper. Uh, I first encountered it as a lecture uh, that the philosopher Cora Diamond gave, a philosopher whose work I particularly admire, who teaches down the road, uh, at Virginia or up the road. A paper entitled uh, The Difficulty of Reality and the Difficulty of Philosophy, a piece in which at a certain point she deploys an idea of mine in a way I found heartening and distinctively instructive. Uh, Torrell's uh, a great friend and uh, went to the trouble to try to portray uh, something of each of the things I've done. She also said, I've never tried this one before, and that's true. Um, and uh, I want uh, to be careful to uh, try to limit the expectation of how much I'm going to do or feel that I have done um, in an hour or so or less. Uh, reading her paper uh, made such a strong impression on me that I came to feel compelled to articulate a response to it, however unsure I felt my philosophical ground might prove to be. A Diamond's paper takes up certain extremities of conflict associated with the phenomena of what she calls the difficulty of reality. They are cases in which our human capacities to respond, she in effect says the bases or limits of our human nature, are for some put to the test threatening to freeze or overwhelm understanding and imagination, while at the same time for others, the phenomenon or fact fails to raise, or perhaps it only succeeds in raising, an eyebrow from most people. For example, responses of being overwhelmed either by instances of being struck dumb by sublime beauty or speechless before horror. The principal matter that Diamond uh, treats in her paper is the fact and the understanding of the fact of our entwinement with the non-human world of animals, specifically and most extendedly our relation to the mass preparation of animals as food for humans. It's a matter whose implications I have hitherto not devoted consecutive thought, and it is a matter that I now feel I have avoided because it's pervasive. I say at once that while relations to animals have come up variously, if intermittently, in my writing over the years, and Toro Moy just cited a number of instances of that, I am neither practiced in the theory of animal rights nor committed in my daily life to vegetarianism. But an idea which is said to test or threaten the limits of human nature reminds me that in my early reflections on Wittgenstein's study of seeing something as something, I raised the question whether it makes sense to, see, to speak of seeing others or ourselves as human, as opposed to what? If it does, then it makes sense to suppose that we may fail to see ourselves and others so, a purported condition that I went on to call soul blindness. A subtext of my reflections to follow here is the question whether there is a comparable blindness we may suffer with respect to non-human animals. The obvious bearing of Wittgenstein's study of seeing something as something on Diamond's wish to have us ponder the human and the intellectual challenges of the mass production of animals for food 
lies in its suggestion that the extreme variation in human responses to this fact of civilized existence is not a function of any difference in our access to information among us. No one knows or can literally see anything here that others fail to know and to see. But then if one concludes that the variation is a function of a response to or of an attitude towards information that is shared, one may suppose the issue is of some familiar form of moral <coughs> disagreement. Diamond's discussion specifically questions this supposition. One peculiarity of the case of breeding animals for manufacturing of food, beyond the extremity of responses ranging from horror to indifference, unlike difficulties over the death penalty, or the legitimacy of a war, or the torture of prisoners, or euthanasia, or abortion, is that the issue is one that touches the immediate and perhaps invisible choices of most of the members of a society every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Further, those who are indifferent to or tolerant of the mass killing of animals for food may well regard the purpose of the institution as producing an enhancement of modes of human life's greatest pleasures, from the common pleasures of sharing nourishment to the rare pleasures of consuming exquisite delicacies. It, may, it seems safe to say that no one of balanced mind thinks it an enhancement of human pleasures to perform executions or abortions or to torture. Nietzsche may have exceptionally divined pleasure taken in not dissimilar activities, and Himmler may have shared his view in warning the minions under his command in the SS that their deeds of extermination must be carried out soberly and dutifully. The variation of attitudes that Diamond's discussion stresses between the horror of individuals and the indifference of most of society considers moments in which the variation of response seems one between visions of the world, between how its practices are seen or regarded or taken to heart or not. Wittgenstein's reflections on seeing aspects, most memorably using the gestalt figure of a duck rabbit, see it this way as a duck, that way as a rabbit, but not at the same time, both, to demonstrate incompatible ways of reading or seeing a situation, was brought into more general intellectual circulation when Thomas Kuhn used the idea of a gestalt switch specifically in understanding certain crises in intellectual history, specifically in the history of science. But in Wittgenstein's elaboration of his reflections on the phenomenon of the Gestalt figure, he emphasizes that hugely many interrelated phenomena are possible concepts here and are brought into play. Among them, these are Wittgenstein's ideas, the concept of merely knowing, and of reading a poem or narrative with feeling, as opposed to merely skimming the lines for information, and of being struck by or blind to a likeness, and of a picture helping one to read with the correct expression. I might characterize Diamond as raising the question of what I will call inordinate knowledge. Knowledge whose, important, whose importunateness can seem excessive in its expression. Horror, I'm saying. Uh, in contrast to mere or uh, unobtrusive or intellectualized or indifferent or stored knowledge archived for our use, as though for some the concept of eating animals has no particular interest, arguably another direction of questionable, here one would say defective expression. I think of a remark of Freud's in rehearsing the progress of coming into one's own through the talking cure. Freud says, there's knowing, and there is knowing. And I suppose in another register, this variability of condition is what Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, cites in the phrase, now I know in part. That's the through a glass darkly passage. I think, too, of my efforts to understand the appeal to the ordinary 
and the philosophical practices of the later Wittgenstein, of J.A. Austin, hence of the tendency they counter in traditional philosophy, since at least Plato's cave, of seeking systematically to transcend or to impugn the ordinary in human existence. As though philosophy has, through its life over a couple of millennia, been fearful of the ordinary, of ordinary existence. The vivid extremes in responding to the worldwide existence of food factories is a cautionary, even lurid example, warning against supposing that the ordinary is a given, as it were a place. I would rather say that it is a task, as the self is. Are these food factories ordinary things to accept, or are they extraordinary, remarkable things that we, perhaps without knowing it, slink outside of past? I won't be arriving here at some conclusion about how far the concept of seeing things in a certain way may bear on either inordinate or insipid expression. Such a suggestion comes up inconclusively a couple of times in what follows. Its point will be to specify moments at which we know we stand in need of a convincing account of the extreme differences of response to the eating and other questionable uses of non-human animals. Since in lacking such an account, we betray a register of our ignorance of our own lives. In the paper of diamonds that I begin from here, her reflections are principally cast as a commentary on moments from the presentation depicted by a pair of stories by the Nobel Prize novelist J.M. Coetzee. I know about six pronunciations of his name. Uh, I'll just say Coetzee. Uh, it, it was sworn to me by somebody who knows him that that's how he pronounces it. Uh, what I've come to realize is that what people do is say, by the way, how do you pronounce your name? Kotsi? And he says, yes. <laughs> or you would say, and for all the other six uh, rates, he's very agreeable. <laughs> the pair of stories with the title, The Lives of Animals, I say. The pair appear under this title as two of the seven chapters that make up Kotsi's novel, Elizabeth Costello, which has a recent extension just published. The pair also appear in a separate volume, also entitled The Lives of Animals, this time accompanied by responses from five writers from various disciplines. It's that latter volume that Diamond considers. She stresses her finding herself in one decisively consequential respect in a different isolated position from each and all of those five interdisciplinary respondents despite the fact that she and they all express unhappiness with the state and the understanding of the state of the human relation to the non-human animal world. We'll come to Diamond's, what she regards as her isolating difference in due course. A public academic lecture is apt to refer to texts not everyone present has read while proposing some uh, it, that they might get a hearing um, at some later stage, some curiosity about it. Um, that's unlike, but also not quite unlike, a classroom lecture where you try to entice people, where you drop names uh, and hope that the, the hint is taken. Uh, so little can one ever say in the course of a class or a day. So I should also say that I'm not going to refer to substantial parts uh, in either the Kotsi or the Diamond texts um, that I uh, will refer to. I will be citing uh, sufficient passages, I hope, I think, I meant to, that you will need in order to judge the issue that I will try to lay out here. The first of this pair of Kotsi stories features a lecture to a college audience in the United States given by a fictional Australian writer named Elizabeth Costello as a part of the two or three day celebration in which she's being honored by the college. In the opening moments of her lecture, Costello reports herself unable to put aside her perception or vision in all its offensiveness that in the treatment of animals in what she calls our food factories. Uh, we are, she says, quoting her 
to say it openly, surrounded by an enterprise, referring to these factories for preparing food for humans, surrounded by an enterprise of degradation, cruelty, and killing, which rivals anything that the Third Reich was capable of, indeed dwarfs that, in that ours is an enterprise without end." End quote. In the second of the stories Diamond is responding to, Coetzee includes near its beginning a letter from someone that Elizabeth Costello's son, uh, who teaches at the college, describes as a poet who has been around the college forever, he says. I quote most of the words of that poet's letter to Elizabeth Costello, anticipating my wanting to return to various words from it. Dear Mrs. Costello, the poet writes, excuse me for not attending last night's dinner. I have read your books and I know you are a serious person, so I do you the credit of taking what you said in your lecture seriously. At the kernel of your lecture, it seemed to me, was the question of breaking bread. If we refuse to break bread with the executioners of Auschwitz, can we continue to break bread with the slaughterers of animals? You took over for your purposes the familiar comparison between the murdered Jews of Europe and slaughtered cattle. You misunderstand the nature of likenesses. I'm still in the poet's letter. You misunderstand the nature of likenesses to the point of blasphemy. Man is made in the likeness of God, but God does not have the likeness of man. If Jews were treated like cattle, it does not follow that cattle are treated like Jews. The inversion insults the memory of the dead. It also trades on the horrors of the camps in a cheap way. Forgive me if I am forthright, you said you were old enough not to have time to waste on niceties, and I am an old man too. Yours sincerely, Abraham Stern. Now, Costello's daughter-in-law, with whom she does not get along, refers to the letter as a protest. And the letter does seem to collect, as if to preempt, a number of attacks that any reader might want, or a sensitive reader, might want to launch against Costello's, Costello's speech, excuse me. But especially in the light of the daughter-in-law's general dismissal of Costello's speech, uh, and of Costello's sensibility in general, and without speculating about what may be causing it, we can be sure that this is not enough to say about the anguish of that letter. In particular, the letter avoids considering the specific understanding that Stern expresses to account for his absence at last night's dinner. Along with other omissions uh, among the appeals that Stern addresses to logic in his distress, to matters of what follows from what, while Stern opens with the coup of raising the question of breaking bread in this context of invitation to dinner, he omits to say, why he had, he had refused precisely to break bread last night with Mrs. Costello. Was it because her words have reached to the point of blasphemy, to dishonoring the work of God? It is an issue for certain thinking about the Holocaust, whether it should be represented at all. Or was it because she insults the memory of the dead? Or because she invokes horror cheaply? Oddly or ironically, these are causes that Costello could well find pertinent to her own sense of horror, or as she sometimes puts it, disorientation. But this is not how Stern introduced the idea of breaking bread. He was granting, I assume, the truth of the idea that we are right to refuse to break bread with the executioners at Auschwitz. That black meal would, let us say, curse communion incorporating, symbolically of course, the human ingestion of bread as the body and wine as the blood of divinity. Stern's refusal of communion with the executioners at Auschwitz forms a sort of major premise, as it were, of the syllogism he attributes to Costello. Her minor premise is that the slaughterers of animals are in a moral or spiritual class with the executioners at Auschwitz, from which the conclusion follows that we are right to refuse to break bread with these further slaughterers. 
But are we to take it that Stern finds Costello's offensive fault of argumentative assimilation to warrant assimilating her to receiving a treatment of shunning precisely marking the treatment warranted by the executioners at Auschwitz beyond the pale of shared bread? This reaction would seem to make his perception of Costello's fault quite as inordinate as he takes her perception of the slaughterers of animals to be. Or should this count as Stern's doing what he promised at the outset of his letter to do, namely taking what Elizabeth Costello said at the beginning and through her lecture seriously? Taking expressions seriously or a sense of difficulty with realizing this project is a way I might characterize what Diamond names the difficulty of philosophy, something she understands to inhabit or to be inhabited by the difficulty of reality, as if philosophy is always a concentration, a confrontation, and an examination of the one philosophizing. I associate this mutual existence with what I've sometimes discussed as a chronic difficulty in expressing oneself, especially in its manifestation as finding a difficulty or a disappointment with meaning, or say with language, or with human expression as such. It's part of the underlying subtext, I believe, of Diamond's text. She is also a wonderful reader of Wittgenstein. It is a disappointment that I find fundamental to the way I read Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations. In an essay from 1978, which uh, Diamond entitles Eating Meat and Eating People, she identifies herself as a vegetarian and specifies her motive in writing about the question, how might I go about showing someone that he had reason not to eat animals, as that of attacking the arguments and not the perceptions of philosophers who express the sense, quoting Diamond again, of the awful and unshakable callousness and unrelentingness, unrelentingness with which we most often confront the non-human world." Unquote. The arguments, familiarly in terms of animal rights, Diamond finds not just too weak, but the impulse to argument at this level to be itself morally suspicious. I have, I think, felt this way at certain moments when, in particular, in response uh, to my expressing doubt that there are moral truths for whose certainty moral theory should undertake to provide proofs, philosophers more than once have proposed to me the uh, truth, it is wrong to torture children. Presented to me as a certain truth to which moral theory has the responsibility of providing an argument. And at least one philosopher added an argument strong enough to convince Hitler. In my book, The Claim of Reason, I reply to this train of thought by saying that morality is not meant to check the behavior of monsters. I have not, I believe, anywhere considered in detail the dangers of allowing oneself to judge another to exhibit monstrousness. And perhaps that's been because I felt sure that I would be told that the danger of such a judgment is that others might take it into their heads to judge me to be a monster without argument. But it does not, I have to say, make me feel safer to suppose that my defense against a judgment of my monstrousness must be to discover an argument to combat it. The danger I still feel worth pursuing is that or how I might discover monstrousness in myself. What is Thoreau seeing when he declares, I never knew a man worse than myself? And I think even after the beautiful sentences in that very great philosophical work of Walden, he means it. I do not imagine that it has been a sense of poor argumentation on behalf of vegetarianism that has helped prevent me from becoming vegetarian. A clear inkling of the pertinence of the choice of that form of life for me was likely, I have thought, to present itself exactly in consequence of my discovery of my love of Thoreau's multiple intelligence. I recall the strong effect upon me 
of his saying that he has no objection to young boys learning to hunt and to fish, taking Thoreau to mean that in the age of innocence, the period Emerson calls the neutrality of boys. The young should feel in themselves that they are part of, equal to, the wildness of nature, that they sense and relish, not fear or distrust, their own, let's say, animal aliveness, and is going on to cite the day on which, as Thoreau reports it, he discovered that in fishing he felt a certain lowering of respect for himself. It is from about then, backed by further of Thoreau's observations, that I've sometimes half expected an analogous feeling to come my way, despite the fact that there was no one in my early life from whom to learn how to fish or hunt. In Diamond's earlier essay, she isolates a line from a poem of Walter de la Mer's. The line, if you would happy company win, namely the companionship of a nimble titmouse. Uh, de la Mer says of it, in contrast to the idea shared by the, uh, sorry, Diamond says of that line, in contrast to the idea shared by the five commentators accompanying uh, the Kotsi, Kotsi uh, stories that she's uh, commenting about, that it presents, quoting Diamond, a different notion of a non-human animal, namely the notion of a living creature or fellow creature, which is not a biological concept, unquote. What Diamond explains she means by her different notion is one that is not the concept of an animal possessing this or that interest or capacity in common or at variance with our human interests or capacities, but rather one that, quoting her again, means a being which may be sought as company. If you would happy company, win. That experience, end quote, <clears throat> talking about a different concept of an, of an animal, not a biological concept, a concept of the animal in relation to me, as being company for me. It's the experience of company, say, of proving to us that we are not alone in the world, and not an argument about the animal's biological powers that, on Diamond's views, places consuming the animal out of reasonable bounds. I recall passages in various texts of mine in which I have, over the years, been prompted to record, coming, it could seem, from nowhere, encounters with animals, real and imaginary. Thinking of Emerson at the moment, perhaps it was Thoreau, observing a squirrel arching across a field, and his being prompted to say that squirrels were not made to live unseen. I moved to record from a time within the childhood of my two sons, my watching almost every day during the early weeks of winter, the following scene play itself out beyond the kitchen window looking into the back garden of our house. We'd strung a thin rope diagonally across a corner angle of the garden fence in order to suspend from the middle of the rope a bird feeder. This was designed to keep the two or three most familiar neighborhood squirrels away from the seeds before the birds had a chance at them. When initially the squirrels tried to maneuver themselves along the rope, some, something about it, perhaps its thinness, perhaps its slack, foiled them. But the next day, one of the squirrels negotiated the rope all the way to the feeder and tipped it so that its seeds fell to the ground, thus providing a repast for him or hers, companions, and eventually himself. I was surprised at how quickly it became obvious to me that on successive mornings it was invariably the same genius performing this mission on behalf of his little group. Before our family devised a further way to protect the bird's interests, I inwardly looked forward each day to encountering and saluting this gesture of virtuosity and careless sociability. Since it was in part my seeds, that this benefactor distributed and ate, it expresses my sense of the situation to say, as I observed him while having my morning coffee and roll, I was breaking bread with him, <coughs> in common if not reciprocally. What would follow? This sense is, I agree, perfectly incompatible with the idea of my eating the fellow. 
But I have, in any case, never had such an idea with respect to squirrels. The idea has, in the past, been proposed to me with respect to rabbit and to horse and to snails, not unfamiliar. In each case, I, as it were, for the sake of philosophy, tried each just once. But my inward cringe at the idea of a repetition in these cases did not transfer to my other carnivorous habits. Nor am I tempted here to a conclusive rebuke to myself of inconsistency. I am impressed, as Diamond is, by Elizabeth Costello's rueful admission, along with her inordinate knowledge of the use of animals for food, on her relative complacence, anyway willingness, in wearing leather shoes and carrying a leather purse. I suppose the admission is to word off the attribution to herself of an unknowable purity of spirit. Diamond speaks in this connection of inescapable but bitter compromise. That greatly interests me, and I mean to return to it. <clears throat> Diamond's emphasis on company, earning the companionship of the titmouse, is a fairly exact precursor uh, etymologically of Coetzee's Abraham Stern's sense in his letter of breaking bread. That's roughly what companion is a companion. An idea that Stern charges Costello with pressing into cheap service, but which Diamond takes from Costello with utmost seriousness. This means that she takes seriously the inordinateness in Costello's response, I mean brings into question just what is disproportionate or inordinate about it. One could say she respects Costello's brush with madness. And perhaps she therewith brings into question her inability to be reasonable about these factories. One could say she respects Costello's brush with madness. And perhaps she therewith brings into question whether proportionateness is the question. Here's a place we might ask whether it would be helpful to think of Costello to be seeing animals as company. But rather than intensifying insipid knowledge, this appeal to seeing something as something seems here to etiolate inordinate knowledge, or rather to make the company of animals something less than a fact, namely the fact that they are, not serve as company, anyway for some, sometimes, Diamond emphasizes Costello's state of raw nerves, or as Costello sometimes describes her, her insecurity with her own humanity. Diamond gets quickly in her C essay to that moment she takes most signally to differentiate her perception of his tale, hence to isolate herself from the position of those who had been invited to respond to it. She focuses on the moment, one she discovers essentially to be passed by in their responses, in which Costello declares herself to be analogous, analogously with Kafka's great ape in Kafka's tale, Address to an Academy, an ape who uh, transforms himself in the course of the talk to being human. Quoting Costello now, um, <coughs> You know, I'm forgotten, actually, at the moment, whether these words are Kafka's quoted by Costello or Costello's words as written by Coetzee. Um, partly, I'm for the moment forgetting that because um, Cora Diamond so identified with uh, Elizabeth Costello in, this, uh, in these passages. Um, anyway, the, the tale, the, the text, uh, 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 the Diamond's text, focuses on the words um, uh, as from Kafka's Address to an Academy, as follows, I am not a philosopher of mind, but an animal, exhibiting, yet not exhibiting, to the gathering of scholars, a wound. A wound which I cover up under my clothes, no, it's, Eliz it's, it's, it's uh, Elizabeth Costello speaking, which I cover up under my clothes, but touch on in every word I speak. I quote this one more time. I am, says Elizabeth Costello, not a philosopher of mind, but an animal, exhibiting yet not exhibiting to a gathering of scholars a wound 
which I cover up under my clothes, but touch on in every word I speak." Unquote. In thus taking her own existence to be one among the lives of animals in the story, it becomes the chief object or subject of the story, the singular life depicted in it that counts as multiple, the human as the animal of multiple lives, say drawn between wild and tame, or this way with one person, that way with another, open and hidden, old without being sure how to be old, capable of indecorousness in her work, suffering in and suffering from what she says, suffering from her own indictment by it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since Diamond rejects, congenially to my way of seeing things, the idea of a way or a set of ways in which non-human animals differ from human animals, a way that explains why we might not wish or allow ourselves to eat them. I take the suggestion to be that the realms differ and hence are akin endlessly, as in the case of the separation or differences between the human and the divine. The appearance, <clears throat> excuse me, the appearance of the religious in Cossi's tale repeatedly becomes pressing. That will have to be mostly for some other time. For example, an animal's way of eating, and so the diet integral to an animal's species life form, differs from human eating as significantly as an animal's mating, or parenting, or building, or foraging, or bonding, or mortality, or attention, or expectation, or locomotion, differs from and is analogous to. One might sometimes say is an allegory of their forms in human life. Cossi's book opens this way. There is first of all the problem of the opening, namely how to get us from where we are, which is as as yet nowhere, to the far bank. It is a simple bridging problem, a problem of knocking together a bridge. People solve such problems every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I take Coetzee's uh, repetition of solve or solving three times in two adjacent sentences, ironically but tenderly, to picture people, as he calls them, in attempting to make human life a series of problems, as attempting to construe their existence as itself a problem, an intellectual puzzle to solve and from which, which to push on over a bridge. Nietzsche enters a similar complaint of intellectualization against our species in its regarding life, quoting Nietzsche as a riddle, a problem of knowledge. Philosophical investigations of Wittgenstein is in effect a portrait of the unsatisfiability of the human species with its solutions, a portrait hardly the first, detailing human life as one of restlessness, exposure, insecurity, and more specifically, of what in an essay of mine on the aesthetics of the investigations, I identify as its articulation of the modern subject, namely its expected reader. Uh, as one characterized by, in very specific moments, each of them, among other traits characterized by the human subject, perversity, sickness, self-destructiveness, suffocation, lostness, strangeness, and so on. Uh, above all, I think, restlessness. This may helpfully return us to the question of taking seriously Elizabeth Costello's notation of herself as an animal wounded but with a wound. Unlike other suffering animals, that she exhibits and does not exhibit. That she specifies her concealing it under her clothes immediately alerts us to the most obvious or banal unlikeness between her condition and that of other animals, namely just that her species does wear clothes. And since what is concealed and is not concealed under her clothes, we are allowed to assume 
are we not, is an aging but otherwise unharmed woman's body. The torment she expresses is somehow to be identified with the very possession of a human body, which is to say, with being human. I say otherwise unharmed human body. I'm assuming that there is no visible remnant of harm from the event she describes in a later chapter when half a century ago she allowed herself to be picked up by a tough who beat her up. And when she found she wanted to when she found she wanted to repel his advances, she suffered from that a broken jaw, and she describes its treatment and its healing. What counts as a wound persisting from that incident is her perception that the tough took evident pleasure in beating her. This produced in her what she describes as her first knowledge of evil, something not hidden by clothes. I do not know Cossé's attitude toward the work of Freud, let alone Lacan, but I cannot put aside a suggestion I take that there is something hinted at as specifically wounded in the normal female body. I emphasize two peculiarities about this revelation of the woundedness that marks being human, perhaps to be uh, at once and generally identified as the possession of the knowledge of evil. We leave that open. First, since the stigmata of the suffering are coincident with the possession of a human body, the right to enter such a claim universally to other such possessors has roughly the logic of a voice in the wilderness crying out news that may be known inordinately, inordinately to virtually none, but to all virtually. It's a voice invoking a religious, not alone philosophical register. It is uninvited. It goes beyond an appeal to experiences that we can assume all humans share or recognize, which philosophy must assume. And it is meant to instill belief and a commentary and community based on belief, yielding a very particular form of passionate utterance, call it prophecy. We could say that the object of the revelation is not simply to touch, but to announce the wound that has elicited its expression and that gives it authority. Costello had said, in matching our behavior with that in the Third Reich, ours, our mass manufacturing of corpses, is an enterprise without end. You remember, unquote. It is an inherently indecorous comparison, our food factories with Hitler's human factories of corpses. Not to say offensive and perhaps deliberately a little mad, fervent news from nowhere. The right to voice it is not alone an arrogation of a claim that every human being is in a position to make, the sort of claim that philosophy requires of itself in speaking for all, it is also a judgment that distances itself from the human as it stands, that finds human company itself touched with noxiousness. Here is a place at least to mention the apparent congruence between Costello's comparison of food factories and concentration camps with a pair of sentences attributed to Heidegger from an interview published after his death, uh, translated uh, in an issue of Critical Inquiry a few years ago that was devoted to Heidegger and Nazism. Heidegger is reported to have said, agriculture is now a mechanized food industry. Well, that much uh, is said essentially word for word uh, in an essay of Heidegger's called The Question of Technology from 1955. The attributed pair of Heidegger's sentences now continues from the interview after his death. As for its essence, that is technology's essence, it is the same thing as the manufacturer of, as the manufacturer of corpses in the gas chambers and the death camps, the same thing as the blockades and the reduction of countries to famine. I assume that's referring to Stalin's starvation of four million Ukrainian kulaks. The same, continuing with Heidegger now, the same thing as the manufacture of hydrogen bombs. Mechanized food industry, 
gas chambers, death camps, and hydrogen bombs. The same thing, namely made possible by technology, modern technology. I rather imagine, but this is not essential to my reflections, that Cossé knew this citation from Heidegger linking the food industry with, among other things, the death camps, and that he meant to be putting Heidegger's words to the test in his novel. In effect, to ask whether such a view is credible, coming anywhere but from an old artist, tired of, sickened almost to death by the responses she receives late in her life of words, crazed by their reality to her, together with their loss of interest to others, and jarred or compelled by her imagination into welcoming the offense she may cause. She gives up on all other possibilities. <clears throat> One of the moments in Heidegger's What is Called Thinking that I'm most impressed by is his description of Nietzsche in trying to reach his contemporaries with his perception of the event of our murder of God. Heidegger writes, most quiet and shyest of men, Nietzsche endured the agony of having to scream, unquote. I find it illuminating to think of Elizabeth Costello in her exhausted way as screaming. A further detail suggesting the presence of Heidegger's what is called thinking in Cossé's text lies in that opening picture of a reader's journey or a life's journey as from a near to a far bank, posing a problem from which people are able to push on. He calls it, speaking for these problem solvers, a bridging problem. Heidegger says, early in this book of his, called what is called thinking, with respect to the passage uh, from our scientific or intellectualized mentality to authentic philosophical thinking, he says to get to philosophical thinking, there is no bridge. There is only what Heidegger calls the leap. It follows, therefore, that the opening paragraph of Cossé's novel describes us, human beings, pushing on, getting on, going along, solving problems in terms, I take it, dictated by others, as not in a position or a place for thinking or for what is to be called thinking. One in whose imagination Heidegger survives as a serious thinker is apt to have had to find a way beyond the sense that his thought comes to direct itself as an apology for the practices of Nazism, despite certain of his declared reservations concerning its theories and some of the practices. Since it is Elizabeth Costello's comparison of food factories with death camps that invoked Heidegger's linking of the camps with the agricultural industry, I mark her difference from Heidegger at a point at which Cora Diamond, in contrast to the initial silence on the point by the five commentators published together with Cotzi's pair of stories, where she unveils, as it were, her now inescapable knowledge of her hidden yet unconcealable wound. Heidegger acknowledges no such wound for him to confess, him of all people, or to scream. And it is perhaps in this continence or absence on Heidegger's part that he is cursed. I said that there are two peculiarities in Elizabeth Costello's invocation of human existence as wounded. The first is what I described as her identification of woundedness, judging from her own, with the condition of human embodiment, the very possession of the human body as stigma, wish to hide. The second peculiarity is her claim that the evidence for her invisible, visible wound or expression of it is present, or as she puts the matter, is touched on in every word she speaks. In my experience, a precedent for such a thought or vision is Emerson's way of speaking, epitomized in his declaration in nothing less than self-reliance, quoting him that every word they say chagrins us, adding, so that we know not where to set them right, says Emerson. But what differentiates them from us, them who, uh, whose every word chagrins us? 
Every word Emerson hears chagrins him well, but all the words he speaks are in essence, to begin with, the words of others. Common bread, what other words are there? This means that every word he speaks is touched with, is fated to express chagrin. To speak, the signature expression of the human form, that's what differentiates us, we feel, is to be victimized by what there is to say or to fail to say on our own. A topic that brings Emerson's chagrin to fever pitch is slavery. I quote from his essay, Fate. Language, language must be raked. The secrets of the slaughterhouses and infamous holes that cannot front the day must be ransacked to tell what Negro slavery has been, unquote from Emerson. In that essay, Emerson had said, you have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in the graceful distance of miles, there is complicity, expensive races. This somewhat extends Emerson's earlier in the essay having spoken of expensive races where he continues race living at the expense of race. I will not re-argue here my sense that the repeated presence of the slaughterhouse together with the ambiguity of race living at the expense of race, yields uh, meaning the human race living at the expense of animals, of course, but in this context, unmistakably meaning uh, at the same time the white race living at the expense of the black, yields the perception or vision that slavery is a form of cannibalism. Essential to his argument, if that's what it is, is that the idea of language as having to be raked compresses a suggestion that in moments high and low, the house of language is overrun, overcome. Words must be searched through for wreckage and then with force and craft aligned or realigned into parallel justified ranks on a page to work decorously together. Such matters, recalling what Diamond speaks as at the difficulty of reality and of philosophy, will have to be taken seriously if we consider whether it expresses the perception at issue to say that Emerson here, sleeves, here sees slavery as cannibalism. This would make the concept of seeing as a kind of explication of allegory, as when at the opening of Walden, Thoreau reports his vision of his townspeople of Concord, Massachusetts, as observing practices meant to torment themselves, as though they are choosing and not choosing to make human life a set of strange forms of penance, a vision that flares and fades for Thoreau. Whereas I wanted to speak of the impression of cannibalism as perhaps irreversible. I report also in this connection, as I have before, Thoreau's treating human feeding as such, as a matter for anxious satire. In the account of Thoreau's expenses, uh, those two years at Walden, well, these are expenses he totes up after his first year, the literal listing of dollars and cents expended for surviving his first year at Walden, Thoreau itemizes the cost of food, came to $8 plus for the year. I thus unblushingly, publish my guilt, says Thoreau. Well, Thoreau here perceives his very existence, the assertion of the will to live in the world by feeding himself sufficiently to exist as without justification. There are debts, or complete justification, there are debts in living, conditions of existence, uses to which he puts or fails to put the peaceable space cleared for him before he cleared it, that are uncountable debts. What makes them insupportable is the degree to which they are unnecessary, the degree to which we live unnecessarily expensively. Then the quest in which an adventurous life may well be spent in search or experiment is to replace faults by true necessaries or means to what one fully, thought truly, finds good. Uh, a philosophical quest, that of distinguishing real from artificial necessity, is a quest uh, as ancient as Plato's Republic, perhaps promising to allow the cloaking of the wound of existing 
to be superfluous if we could find out what our real need, as Wittgenstein says, is. Of course, one may wish to ask whether Thoreau would not have more relevance to the way the world is if he were a little more realistic, say more open to compromise. Albert Schweitzer in Africa, once a more formidable guide to existence than I suppose he is now, instead of or in addition to protecting his hoard from the ants, left little piles of sugar for them by his bed in his tent when he required in the jungle for the night. Is such a practice from our contemporary perspective anything more than precious or quaint? But perhaps it was not meant as more than one man's solace. Yet Thoreau's key term economy, the title of the opening longest chapter of Walden, precisely projects an unfolding register of terms in which compromise at its best, keeping accounts in a fallen world of one's interests and means and losses and wastes and returns and borrowings and dreams and terms, accounts of all of one's terms, can be articulated systematically and lived. That's what economy means for him. I predicted that I would want to return to the idea of compromise. Here more fully is Cora Diamond's response in her Kutsi essay when she takes up in connection with my own discussion in the last part of A Claim of Reason of what I call our exposure to each other, to the other, I may say. Costello's reply to someone's suggestion that her vegetarianism comes out of moral conviction. Costello hesitantly deflects that suggestion, saying instead, it comes out of a desire to save my soul. Diamond glosses this response as follows. We are not given the presence or absence of moral community with animals, but we are exposed. That is, we are thrown into finding something we can live with, and it may be at best a kind of bitter tasting compromise. There is here only what we make, each of us, of our exposure." Unquote. <clears throat> Can we specify more closely the cause and strength of the bitter taste of compromise in a region in which taste may be thought to be everything? Taste or some discrimination beyond what we readily think of as taste seems at play in Costello's cautioning or rebuking her questioner who had assured her that he has a great respect for vegetarianism as a way of life, thus in effect discounting her declaration of the threatened stale state of her soul beyond the matter of moral conviction by saying to him, I'm wearing leather shoes and carrying a leather purse. I wouldn't have over much respect if I were you. That is, there is still a disproportion between what I know and how I feel and ways I behave, if less than there might be. Costello's questioner, he identifies the president of college that's honoring her, murmurs to her, Consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Surely one can draw a distinction between eating meat and wearing leather, unquote. She replies, degrees of obscenity. <laughs> replies, that is, to him. Replies to his question. I merely take notice of this placement of Emerson's famous and famously mocked crack about the hobgoblin of consistency casually misquoted in the mouth of a decorous college president and used casuistically to take the sting from a declaration of one's soul threatened. Here is a welcome occasion to show Emerson's uncompromising words compromised. Yesterday's radical words picked up by today's stuffed shirt. Very common stretch of history. But then and easy to say. But what are we to make of Costello's use of degrees of obscenity? She's implying her state as participating in obscenity, but the fact is that wearing leather or the vision of preparing it for human comfort and vanity does not seem to cause her body dangerously to signal itself of its woundedness. Is it then in her case not the necessity of compromise that causes bitterness, but rather the discovery that she is, that her body is capable of compromise? 
This may suggest not a fastidiousness, but a vanity of spirit. But how does this reach to the sense of having to conceal, without concealing, a wounded body? Is it a function of some perception of disproportion between saving one's soul and finding alternatives to wearing leather? This is, in fact, no easy matter to determine, especially if it begins to lead to questioning more globally the conditions under which our comforts generally are sustained, and we undertake to examine workhouses as closely as slaughterhouses. As Emerson phrased the matter, however graceful the distance kept, there is conspiracy, expensive races. I cannot doubt that Emerson is here, not for the only time, invoking Rousseau's perception of our state and our stake in the social contract as that of conspirators, even recognizing that the perpetual failure of justice invites the threat of madness, of taking my participation in the difficult reality of my society's injustice or indifference to brutality, as it were, personally, a sense that seems to measure Elizabeth Costello's sense of isolation in her woundedness. This sense happens, the world as too much, the social world as too much, too far away from what it should be, happens even beyond sensibilities such as Hamlet's or Antigone's or Phaedra's or Melisande's, unrelieved bearers of inordinate knowledge of human exposure. The direction out of Costello's condition, as it were, against Kafka's report of a passage or a bridge to a higher species, barring withdrawal from the human race, that is, deciding to stay alive, is to sink within the race or disguise herself as a voting member of it, at one with Hamlet in the perception that mankind pleases me not, nor woman neither. Not prepared to resign from humanity, nor display rage against others for failing to do so, which would uselessly increase the human being's suffering from itself, its horror of itself, Montaigne says, commending a more amiable wisdom. She insists upon her adorning and comforting herself with things of leather. I do not propose a competition between our degree of compromise with the subjection of animals to human demand and that of our compromise with the degree of injustice in our society. I remain too impressed with Freud's vision of the human animal's compromise with existence, the defense or the deflection of our ego and our knowledge of ourselves from what there is to know about ourselves, to suppose that a human life can ever get itself without residue, perfectly into the clear, into the moral pure. It's true that I've sometimes felt vegetarianism to be a way of declaring a questionable distance from the human animal, but that can hardly be a reason for my not taking that path, path when it has beckoned. I am in any case in accord with Cora Diamond's caution about what should count as a reason against eating meat. And I think I may have, in the course of working through the present material to this point, learned something about the wish to declare distance from the identification with one's fellow human animals. I have in the past found that in moral confrontation, I can never say in my defense, and here I'm disagreeing with a moment in the work of my late celebrated colleague, John Rawls, I can never say I am above reproach. Or rather, I have found that to say so is to suggest that the other is morally less competent than I am. Now I find that in response to reminders of the company we may keep with non-human animals, I cannot so much as say, I am not above reproach. If the former defense falsifies my position by claiming an insupportable difference from others, the latter etiolates my position by claiming nothing in particular declaring a generalized guilt in a guilty world, absolving myself from the task of responding to a reason for abstinence, either by denying that I share the vision from which the reason derives its force, namely, I do not see or treat all animals as companions, or with or without urging a different vision, 
eating animals affirms my evolutionary stage as a carnivorous or rather omnivorous animal, or by marking a difference in my taste that shields it from the vision. I do not eat species that I perceive as companions. What I would like to say in my defense is simply, I'm human. But to whom can I offer that plea? Is the threat of inconsistency in relation to other animals a cause of comparable anxiety or bitterness with our inconsistency in our moral relations with other humans? Thinking as examples of the long and terrible list of treacheries for which one asks for forgiveness or forbearance every year on the Day of Atonement. Asking pardon for sins, for wrongdoings, or forbearance every, sorry, for, for, let me start that over, asking, uh, it's no wonder, I don't want to read this list. <laughs> the list of treacheries for which ones ask forbearance or forgiveness on the Day of Atonement, here we go, asking pardons for sins, for wrongdoings, for transgressions committed under duress or by choice, consciously or unconsciously, openly or secretly, in our thoughts or with our words or by the abuse of power or by hardening our hearts or by speaking slander or by dishonesty in our work, and so on and so on. Take as I like to Emerson's remark about the foolish consistency of minds, little or large, as meant to have us consider what we are made of, that we may be and need not be foolish, a foolish consistency. And foolishness is, after all, an affliction that non-humans are free from. What is human flesh that its appetites, even needs, express and threaten the human soul? If there is a threat of madness, persistent and silent outrage or despair are perhaps enough, in reaction to horrors that others seem indifferent to, is there not an equal threat in finding that one is oneself inconsistent in responding to these horrors. What is a proper response to learning and maintaining the knowledge of the existence of concentration camps or of mass starvation? I confess my persistent feeling that a sense of shame at being human, at being stigmatized for having a human body, is a more maddeningly thing directed to the human treatment of human animals than it is to its treatment of its non-human neighbors. I'm confessing that feeling. I do not think I overlook the point that in relation to non-humans, we can take meaningful, so it seems, personal measures. Whereas in the human case, if we are conscious of it, we readily sense helplessness. What then? Shall we unblushingly publish our guilt in remaining sane in a mad world? I assume philosophy is meant to help us here, say help us to be philosophical, but it is then up to us to ask, to go first, to wonder. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.